Welcome to Corner Table Talk. I'm your host, Brad Johnson. We are exploring subjects related to food plus drink plus culture. And as always, with your questions or comments about our show, you can reach me at brad at postandbeamhospitality.com. And I invite you to stick around for the segment of our show we call How We Move with my sister, Ambassador Shabazz. She's going to share some insights into the conversation with our guest today and then tell us a little bit about what she's been up to. And she's always up to something interesting. All right. So as a 40 year veteran of the restaurant industry, it gives me so much pleasure to see the mainstream recognition and opportunities for success afforded to this talented generation of people of color pursuing careers in hospitality. This group of entrepreneurs and chefs is making a name for themselves and illuminating the way forward for the next generation. My guest today, Kwame Onwache, has racked up what I would call a pretty impressive list of accolades. One of Food & Wine's Best New Chefs, Esquire Magazine's 2019 Chef of the Year, and the San Francisco Chronicle said that Kwame was the most important chef in America. That's a big title. I'm not sure how he feels about that, but that's quite an accolade. He is also serving in a new role as Food & Wine's Pro Ambassador to the hospitality industry and creator of the Family Reunion presented by Kwame Onwachi, an annual multi-day event that takes place in Middleburg, Virginia and celebrates diversity in the hospitality community. We're going to talk about that a little bit. And in September of 2021, Kwame hosted the esteemed James Beard Awards. He is also the author of a memoir, Notes from a Young Black Chef, that is being adapted into a feature film. Most recently, Kwame opened Tatiana Restaurant at Lincoln Center, and he returned home to do that. He's a native of the Bronx. We've never met, so Kwame, it's really nice to meet you, brother, and welcome to the show. Hey, it's nice to meet you, too. Thank you. Thank you for that introduction. I really appreciate being here. No, my pleasure, man. And Chef John Cleveland, I have to give him a shout out, the owner and chef of Post and Beam in LA for the intro to you. I know you did an event together, I think this past year, right at Post and Beam? Yeah, we did an event highlighting Black creatives and the hospitality industry. It was beautiful. It was a really great event. He's a good guy, man. I love John. Good brother. We kick things off with what I call our short order questions. So let me fire a few of these at you to get you rolling. What music is in heavy rotation on your playlist lately? Chef, what are you listening to? Right now, Her Loss. It's an album with 21 Savage and Drake. It is in heavy rotation. Erica Badu and Lauren Hill have stayed in rotation for the majority of my life. And yeah, those are like the three things right now that I can say if I press play, you'd probably hear a song from one of them. (laughs) All right. And how about during service? Are you playing music in the kitchen or is it quiet? We have an open kitchen. So the music from the dining room spills into the kitchen. And I play, I have a playlist of everything from Steely Dan to Kendrick Lamar to, yeah, it's a very eclectic playlist. Uh, Everybody finds that groove throughout. Even Montel Jordan's on the playlist and it's a vibe. It's really cool. How does the staff react, man, to having that, the open kitchen and being able to vibe with the energy in the room, like kind of face to face? Oh, they love it. They're dancing half the time while cooking. And the dining room staff, the dancing with a plate in their hands. And when you see like a guest take a bite, the bite to the beat, it's real, it's dope. Nice. So tell me, what footwear are you wearing at work? What's on your feet? I'm normally wearing Prada sneakers, Prada American Cup, all black, patent leather. They just go with everything and you can wipe any sauce off. Okay. How about your favorite spice of the moment? My favorite spice of the moment would have to be mine. I make my own spice blend. It's called House Spice. You can get it on Spiceology.com, but it's a, like an all-purpose seasoning. It's a Creole seasoning. It's actually de- derived from my mom's recipe. And yeah, it's something that we always had. I grew up in a Creole household. So we make our own spice blends. We make our own Creole spice and we put it on everything. Everything gets a little bit of that before it needs. Nice. Spiceology. I like that brand. It's a very cool brand. All right. You're a native New Yorker, brother. Knicks or Nets? I'm going to have to go with the Nets with that one. Oh, I'm going to have to go with the Nets. Oh, yeah. The Knicks just, they've never done it for me my entire career on this earth. They, yeah, they just never really have hit it, but I appreciate them. They are very quintessential New York, but the Nets for me has a little more swag. Maybe a little more promise. I I come from the day of appreciating Walt Frazier and Earl Monroe. So I did see them win a championship. So I can't let go of my Knicks that easy. 
And no, I get it. I get it. Yeah. So my dad used to take me to Knicks games when I was younger and I was a Knicks fan by legacy, I guess, but they would always lose. And I was like four or five years old. So I would cry because I was so competitive and I vowed to never be a Knicks fan when I was a child because of that feeling. Yes. Crying is being a Knicks fan. That's unfortunately, my wife is from Boston and I have the misfortune of having been married to someone that's a Celtic fan now. So I got to live with that. Painful. All right. Last one of these, brother. So tell me, man, if you have one, what's your favorite New York City walk? My favorite New York City walk? It would honestly, as cliche as it is, a stroll through Central Park. It's just always so, filled with so much life. People on bicycles, roller skates, scooters, people double dutching. You have drum circles. You have faint sounds from concerts playing. You have water or ice skating. So I think walking through Central Park is just really dope. It's really dope. I wish there was like better food options in there besides just like hot dogs. But yeah, it's beautiful because you can take a stop in Sheep's Meadow with a picnic basket and just chill, chill out there. So yeah, I would say Central Park is my favorite place to walk through. Yeah, man, I'm with you on that. Maybe a Chef Kwame food truck might be able to liven up that food presentation in the park at some point. All right, man. So jumping in here as a, a native of the Bronx, opening a restaurant in your hometown is one thing. But for the location to be the David Geffen Hall at Lincoln Center, that's a pretty big deal. So just tell me a little bit, how did the deal come about? And can you describe the raw space and what your thoughts were when you first approached the building? Honestly, they just reached out to me and asked me if I wanted to do it. I've been in this industry for a little bit. There was a couple of players involved that were tasked with seeking chefs and they had heard really good things about me and my, the ability for me to create an atmosphere that's like different and unique. And I think Lincoln Center wanted to get in touch with that. And when looking at Lincoln Center, when I do anything, I like to break down all the bricks. So let me break down these bricks. What was here before Lincoln Center was here? And I found out it was old San Juan Hill. And old San Juan Hill was a very fluent or very popular Afro-Caribbean, Afro-Latino area. And it just spoke to me. It was like, I'm supposed to be here. I'm supposed to revive the stories of the people and give a voice to the inaudible. So it, it, it just aligned and the space was a blank canvas. I worked with MN, which is a really great architectural firm. Mm -hmm. And we took elements of my childhood, whether it be the iridescent beams, which tell the story of putting the fire hydrant on and seeing the oil slick a couple hours later from the cars shine on the asphalt or chain link fence is what we have gold, very small micro fences that looks like it's raining gold from the ceilings, but it's reminiscent of the chain link fences. I used to jump as a kid. So it's all these minute little details that we were able to achieve by telling the full story of New York. And that's what the restaurant does. It tells the story of New York, but not the New York that I guess the affluent think of New York. For me, it's, it's the story of immigrants in Puerto Rican, it's Dominican, it's Jamaican, it's Nigerian, it's Senegalese. Like all of these things for me made New York special. Yeah, I've seen photographs of the restaurant. I haven't been there yet, but the juxtaposition of those elements that you describe against what's unavoidable, a glamorous backdrop. And you are talking about Lincoln Center now. How was that collaborative process with MN? I know they've designed some pretty upscale restaurants prior to this, and they're the go-to firm now. Were they very responsive to what you were feeling in terms of the decor? How'd that work, man? I think for them, it was a breath of fresh air. They were finally like aligned on something that adhered to their values, but also was the exact human form, of what they're trying to achieve. Because when we talked, the first thing they did was show me a picture and it was a picture of from afar. You wouldn't really know what it was. It looked like people just break dancing, but when you really look at it, it's rock steady break dancing in like the seventies. And when you look closer, it's rock steady break dancing in the seventies in front of David Geffen Hall. They're like, that's their mood board for all their projects. They say, this is what we want. And when I said I wanted to do a restaurant that was like unapologetically black, so hip hop, but the food is going to be very refined, but, or I hate using that word refined. The food was going to be like very just attentive to every single detail. Those two things can live in the same world. And they've been trying to do that for so long. So when they came along and we linked up, we synced up. And it was just like a match made in heaven. Yeah, man, I feel you. And you also, I read somewhere where you mentioned the light fixtures represent your kind of state of mind as a dreamer. Yeah. So we got these giant clouds that can change color. And my, my head's always in the clouds and people can take that as a negative form uh, where I'm daydreaming. But 
for me, it's like, I'll never stop dreaming. I'll never stop believing that anything is possible. I'll never stop looking up at the clouds and with wonder. And yeah, so that was reminiscent of that. And it's cool to see because it was an idea. And then we contracted an artist to make it and it just worked out so beautifully. Yeah, man. Yeah. I can't wait to see the place. You along with a, a crop of young black chefs have certainly expanded. I hesitate to say the expectation of what black chefs should cook. Again, I'm a second generation restaurateur, 40 years I've been in the business. There has been a certain expectation of what black food is, what black chefs should cook. I've written articles about that. And You've expanded that. You've changed that conversation, man. And following the culinary African diasporic pathway that winds its way through the Caribbean and onto these shores opens up countless avenues for exploration of flavor and ingredients. Yet at the same time, there's comfort and familiarity. And that's what I take away from your menu at Tatiana and reading it and talking. I've talked to a few people that have eaten there. I see items I want to eat. And that is what a menu should do for you. Yes, it's creative and it's cool. And it's a chef's expression of whatever they think they want to do. But when you can make food sound like stuff you want to eat, that to me is working. And on that note, chef, one of the accolades that you got recently, I, I want to bring up, man, because I'm a born and raised New Yorker. The New York Post, Steve Cusio wrote about your pastrami having knocked off cats's and the quote from the post is, move over Katz's. The Big Apple's best pastrami now comes from Tatiana, a stunning new restaurant at Lincoln Center that as thrilling to the taste buds as the venue's much praise redesign is to the years. The Lincoln Center went through a big renovation and supposedly the acoustics are fantastic. Now they were always a problem. Mm -hmm. But to bump off Katz's, man, I mean, that's a legendary pastrami spot, but that's pretty gangster. So talk a, a little bit about the inspiration for that yeah, I will preface those are fighting words. So I don't get in the mix of critiques. Pastrami, it actually came together super last minute. We were like really thinking of a meat dish to do for the restaurant. And I was just like, why don't we do pastrami, but do it like West African style, like suya. And we'll do some cocoa bread, but put caraway in it. So it's like rye bread. And then we'll do some melted cabbage and a mustard sauce. And I tasked the team with taking different of those elements. And we came together and created this really stellar dish. So yeah, it was cool that it was the last item to join the menu and it's our most praised dish, but it's, yeah, I think Katz is legendary. So I don't want to take away from that because they're the ones who introduced me to pastrami, but it's, it's pretty dope. It's pretty dope to get recognition and people to really enjoy it. Yeah. No, I thought that was cool, man. And I hear you on not taking them on in a battle of words, but it's certainly high praise from the post, which can be a little stingy that way. A couple of other items, man, that just jumped out these curried goat patties with mango chutney, the oxtails, rice and peas, thumbelina carrots, jody squash. Brother, you got some stuff on them, man. That's just, you really, you really hit the nail on the head and blending these ideas and cultures under one roof. And as you talked about breaking it down to the bricks, that concept is, again, you revisit that through your food. I think it's important when you have a platform, but also as a chef to find your voice. And I think that's a hard thing to do, especially with all the noise of all the, you have to cook French cuisine, you have to do this, you have to do that. Our food is always shunned to the mom and pop shops and never to the corner of Lincoln Center. So with having that platform, yes, I could have easily have done an American restaurant and it would have been great and we would have served deviled eggs and burgers and things like that. But for me, this is also America to me. This is home. I grew up here and I remember eating this stuff every week. So I know that there's other people like that, but there's also other people that may not have. So being able to share that with them, being able to give people a place to celebrate their culture while celebrating a special experience, they're not shunned to an Italian eatery to propose to their significant other. They're not shunned a French restaurant to celebrate a birthday. They're not shunned to an American restaurant or quintessential like modern American restaurant to have a reception. They can come and they can propose over oxtails because they're also Jamaican. Right? They can come and they can like yeah. eat curry goat patties because they got a promotion. Yeah. You're trying to come up with a way in which I would view your approach to food here. It seems purposeful, yet unconstrained by expectation. Is that accurate in the description of your approach to the menu? I would say it seems purposeful. Like you certainly have a purpose. You want to make a statement here. And yet at the same time, you're not constraining yourself by what others may perceive you should be doing. 
and the elevation. Again, I'm hesitant to use that because when I think of our food traditionally, a lot of times you think of a traditional soul food experience or traditional Caribbean experience. And when you take those cuisines and you blend them and then elevate them in the way that you have, I think that you are providing an opportunity for a real celebration of the cuisine in a way that puts it on par with other fine dining establishments. I love Marcus. I love what Marcus has done with Red Rooster. But I think what you've done here is even different. I guess what I'm trying to say is that it just doesn't seem to me that you were constrained by anybody else's expectation. You did hear exactly what you wanted to do. Yeah, the partners at Lincoln Center, they really trusted me. And I think you can see it in everything. You can see it in the staff that works there. You can see it in the food. You can hear it in the music that's playing. You can feel it in the architectural, the design. Yeah, it's all super intentional. It's all very authentic. And I think that's why it's deemed so different because not a lot of people, not a lot of us have been given that opportunity to do something like that or have been brave enough to just do it and just see what happens. Yeah. I'm pretty, pretty excited at the outcome and honored that it's been received so well by the Post and Eater and the likes of so many affluent people that I look up to. And props to you, man, for the skills to do it. It's one thing to have those ingredients together. They sound good, but if the end result is not, this is delicious. <laughs> it's not working. Exactly. Exactly. That's the common thread. At the end of the day, the food is really good. So the rest of the stuff kind yeah. of falls into place. Yeah. I want to just give a very quick, short order recap of your life story, which has been, I've heard you talk quite a bit about this in interviews and I know you've written a memoir, but you acknowledge that you made some bad choices as a young person and your mom sent you to uh, Nigeria to live with relatives for a couple of years to learn, quote, respect that you backslid a little bit when you came back to the States, but then seeing President Obama ignited a, a different path or the desire for a different path and to create your own narrative. On to culinary school, appearances on Top Chef. You opened and closed your first place. I've been there. I know how painful that must have been. But then you came back with a huge success and opened up a place in D.C., Kith and Kim, which got national recognition and led to some of the accolades that I mentioned earlier. Now here at Lincoln Center, some would say the stage doesn't get any bigger Kwame than this. Lots of high expectations and early praise. You're still a pretty young guy, man. You look to me to be not quite 30, maybe. How are you maintaining your equilibrium given the demands of a restaurant with this kind of profile in the media capital of the world? I just don't pay attention to it. It's not real. What's real is the people that come in there, the experience that I give them. Because they can write good about me one day and write bad about me the next. I know what the media is like. So for me, it's really having those genuine connections and really focusing on that. And I think that's what helps me stay grounded or head in the clouds, however you want to look at it. <laughs> but it's really just focusing on the task at hand. I'm very grateful. And at the end of the day, I know what I'm doing is right. And that's what's important to me more than any accolade or anything. I love your vibe and, and the balance that uh, you may be tired because you've just come <laughs> off probably what's been a very busy weekend. But uh, you do have this presence of calm. Are you a meditator? Do you meditate? No, I do every now and then, but I'm just at a point where life is just so precious and we have a gift of it every single day. I can't waste my time with looking to the past, giving me depression or looking to the future and giving me anxiety. It's really just like being present. Yeah, good man. Just a couple of industry questions here. Just to want to see how these things have affected you. The past few years, we've heard a lot about rising costs, labor shortages. I'm curious, have either of those affected how you conceive the restaurant, Tatiana, did you have a hard time hiring? And what are you doing about the price battle everybody's confronting? We just raised our prices and luckily we're in a place that it allows us to price accordingly. Being in Lincoln Center, being in Midtown. And then for staff, we honestly didn't have a really big problem finding staff. I think a portion of it is being a black chef of my stature having young black cooks that want to come and work. We haven't really had a problem with either of those things. Yeah, the cost of stuff is high, but I just put the price up. Right. Raise the price. Raise the roof. So average cost for a dinner for two would be what? Average cost for dinner for two right now, I think is 160. Okay. That's not terrible. And you mentioned that uh, you had a pretty good turnout of young black chefs. So you see more people of color following in your footsteps and, and desiring that career path? Yeah, I would say all the people that work there are people of color in the kitchen. 
And so I've seen an increase of chefs like taking it very seriously and putting their head down and wanting to be a part of something that's bigger than them. And that's how I feel. This restaurant is bigger than me. It's like, this is a calling card for other institutions or organizations to give chefs of color a chance to cook their food and to see that it's something that can make more, you know, something that people will be attracted to. And about the, uh, the family re reunion event in Virginia, is that something you're going to continue with this coming year? Are you putting that together again? Yeah. Yeah. This will be our third one. For those of you who don't know, it's a four day food festival in Middleburg, Virginia at the Salamander Resort and Spa. It's called the family reunion. And we get like 50 of the best professionals, whether they're writers or chefs or psalms or beverage directors to come and give master classes and do demos and we do parties and breakout sessions and all types of stuff. And it's really special. It's a celebration. That sounds awesome. And maybe you have room for a podcast host this coming year. I'll put my name in the hat. So I read your mom gathered up her life savings to help pay for culinary school. You said on Top Chef that a primary motivating factor for you was to make life easier for your mom, who at that point was still working six days a week. I recognize it's going back a couple of years. And I'm curious, has she been to Tatiana and how does she feel about her investment in culinary school? Yes, she has been. She's extremely proud. It's surreal for her to see something like that. And she feels very good about her investment. I think it's paid off tenfold for her at this point. Yeah, with interest, but she's proud. She afforded me a life that she didn't have or she didn't take advantage of at a young age. And I'm very grateful for her and for her guidance. And the restaurant is named after your sister? Yeah, and she's been in too, and she's just like emotional the whole time. <laughs> just crying in her food. Yeah, exactly. She's seasoning her tears. That's um, beautiful. That's beautiful, it is. man. It is. So I'm sure you're seeing the power players, celebrities, and the like. You're in New York, you're front and center. But I'm curious if any of your old crew from the Bronx has dined at Tatiana and what has been their response? Yeah, yeah. My, my friends have definitely come in. They're just proud. They've been a part of this journey this whole time. And they remember when I was selling candy on the subway outside of Lincoln Center. So it's beautiful. It's beautiful to see. It's beautiful to keep in touch with them because it keeps me grounded at a certain point in, in some way by having those people around me that were there before. That were there when we were just rug rats, like running around New York City. So yeah, they're really proud. And yeah, I see them often. I love that, man. That's great. <laughs> So, Chef, when you look out into the dining room at Tatiana, is the room a reflection of how you want to see the world? Yeah, the dining room at Tatiana is so diverse. I would argue that it's the most diverse upscale dining experience in New York or beyond. And that's what I want to see. I want to see people breaking bread together. I want to see people laughing. I want to see people sharing food. It really is inspiring just to walk through the dining room and hear the laughs and see the smiles and see people seeing themselves represented in a way that's probably beyond their wildest dreams. And then seeing people explore these cultures that they didn't really know how to access them. So it's like a, it's a two-way street and it's just the beginning. We got more restaurants to open. My man. All right, last question. And I know it's probably a little soon to make this call, but who's gonna play you in the movie, man? I have an idea. What about Lakeith Stanfield? I think he might be able to pull it off. He was actually slated to play me, but the movie took so long. Seriously? That Yes. Look it up. I promise you. He was slated to play me, but the movie just took too long. So we're looking at other people. So we'll see. Welcome to Hollywood. I know. <laughs> Chef Kwame, thank you so much, man, for your time today. I appreciate you joining me. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Best of luck, brother. So welcome back, everyone. And I am here with Ambassador Shabazz, who is somewhere on the road doing her thing. Points unknown. Ambassador, what's happening? <laughs> Points unknown indeed. Yeah. So Chef Kwame, Unwatchy. Love him. I absolutely love him. I love the, the sensibility and the balance of a very young, contemporary, visionary, mindful of just preserving and incorporating historic journey through food, right? His references, whether it's the thanks to his parents, whether it is him bringing back the narrative surrounding the new location, giving voice to New York more than just an ad, and texturizing it with just the culture, backgrounds, the kinds of people that, that seem to fill his home, his house. I love this biting to the beat. People were in his restaurant with music and food biting to the beat. I just love it. Yeah, you can picture that, right? 
Yeah, I could picture it. And I'm embarking upon, I would say, 40-year yearning for an eatery of sorts. I haven't zeroed in on the final component other than when he references the cross-sections of culture and all kinds of people breaking bread together. I think that's one of the draws. In addition to me growing up in a house where there was quite a bit of hosting when both parents were with us in my early beginning and me being the maitre d', as it were, of the house. And then as the eldest, those food palates continued as I prepared the food, even as a child for my family, because I love what it does. It feels good. And if you're fortunate enough to be able to be in a space that's supported and you can bring in your relatives and your community and introduce it to yet another, I think would be just real success. I'm listening to him, I'm watching his face, being a storyteller through fruit. Really great. Really wonderful. Yeah, I would have to think, as I was listening to him and also reading through the menu and knowing you as I do, the way that he's taken these various parts of New York from his description of bodegas and food that he might have eaten there and the breaking down of Lincoln Center to the bricks and honoring what was there before, a really unique way of blending the past and the present, the kind of everyday experience that any New Yorker might have with the cuisines based on neighborhoods. And that's how we grew up eating. You would have Chinese food from the Chinese restaurant, Jamaican from the... There's a New York is just that kind of a melting pot. But to take those cuisines and represent them in a way that is beyond the expectation of a crowd that would go to Lincoln Center for an experience, to me, is groundbreaking. Absolutely. And just the manner in which he gives homage to all components, whether it is the predecessor of pastrami or the dedication to his mom or namesake of his sister, it moved my heart in every way, notwithstanding his capacity as a chef, but just the root of and the nature of that particular chef, this particular chef. This young man, Kwame, on watch. And you know a bit, having dealt with the public as a public figure for as long as you have, about not taking the bait. That statement, and it was said tongue-in-cheek by the writer from the Post that he's not Katz's Deli off the block of, as the best pastrami in New York. Well, other chefs might take that and run with it. But he, he was sensible about it, and he sounds to me to have a very balanced approach about the accolades, knowing that the backside of that, what might come. But what's your feeling about his sensibility and his ability to maintain his equilibrium in all of this? I think evidently he's raised right. Whatever lessons were learned, whatever landmines you referenced just as a young person journeying the world and being and going back to his family's roots and coming back, and it's just life lessons. Some people heed the call and some don't. Some continue to step on those landmines and some really are inspired. And I just saw complete regard, no matter, even his range of music for a young person from Steely Dan to Kendrick Lamar, so to speak, and inclusively who's on his present playlist and how he approaches life. I just think that he's young, he's living as a young man, but he's been blessed enough to be able to be very present in context to the opportunities and the regards and bringing his talents to them. So that means he'll be a lifelong learner. We will see aspects of this particular chef, both as a young man and as a culinary genius, evolve every few years. And so you'd want to follow him. That's exciting. You're absolutely right. At the time we're recording this, we're approaching the end of 2022. It's been an interesting year. And looking ahead into 2023, perhaps by the time this segment of our program airs. But Ambassador, what are you reflecting upon and what are you looking forward to? towards as we wind up 2022 and head into 23? That is an answer. I'd probably need a little more time to conclude because I'm exploring that for myself as well. How do I journey forward? There are a lot of people his age and in between them and us 
and life is moving really fast. And we have an opportunity at this point to say, how do I want 60, 70 to look? What do I do with my strengths, my assets, my treasure chest of experiences that are both fulfilling for me as well as those to whom I entrust it? And that is very present on my mind. And I aim to have an answer before New Year to that just because it matters. I don't need the fatigue of perpetual recovery. When I say recovery, being distracted by all of the things that happen in our environments and thus deplete our journey, throwing things off track. But where I am now, I am sitting quietly, really reflecting on the assets that we often live with and are blindsided by the distractions. I'm close to those answers because they live within me. It is just my commitment to myself not to be distracted or take on too much so that I don't get to fulfill those. I think in the large, in the simpler of all of that is how people really unplug. I've been hearing people say that more often. I'm not available this weekend. I'm sorry. I was unplugged. I think that's a good thing that more and more people, and these are young people, our age, we know that's essential, but people who are just not online or diving into social media and treating themselves to hearing their own inner voice. Because I think we live with what those answers are. But if you have too much noise playing, you will be thrown off track. And what is that journey? What is that commitment? What is that personal passion? What is your marrow requesting? It's sitting there waiting for you to respond. Yeah. And I am reminded this past week, I actually took a walk and I left my phone at home. And I normally bring my phone because it has my music or my podcast, whatever I want to listen to on my walk. But it also has my emails and my texts and my phone. It's everything. So I'm not leaving that behind. But I left my phone and I took a walk. And it was such a relief to not have it with me and just let my thoughts go where they were meant to go and allow a little space. To your point, even for those of us who are a little older, who didn't always grow up with a, something in our hands that encompassed our entire world, to disengage is still a process that you have to remind yourself there's value in. Oh my God. Great value and reward. I think when you're able to answer questions, I unfortunately have not, fortunate, unfortunate, however it is, have not had a television for number of years, only because it expired, whatever that is, where I was residing. And so I don't get the news as quickly in my house on 24-hour Blair, and I'm only hearing now about some of the things that are in the headline, but after the fact, right? So do I want to be in front of it like I used to be on every channel, just hearing everybody's interpretation or the sensation of what's going on? Or do I want to be able to kind of enter that for a little bit more prepared and not overwhelmed. And I think I'm preferring the latter part of that just because I'm so porous and so absorbent with information that it can shift me. And that's not always healthy because it's being delivered based on the hot button of the moment and not the clear information. And there's some real things that are topical right now that I'm learning about and I actually need time to assess my feelings about what's hitting the front pages, real discussions in terms of culture, history, religion, interpretations thereof, coexistence, impacts. And I think one thing we're short of is information. We have sentiment, and thus we are knee-jerk. But if we explore some of that, if we read, if we were really engaged in understanding what makes people say the things they say. Now, if they're invalid, it should not throw you off. But, and I say that loosely again, because I have been unplugged. I just know that from friends of mine, when I do correspond online, people are quite upset right now, quite upset and duly on all sides. But I don't think there's been a forum for people to hear the root of argument on either side. Yeah. Just on a final point, but to bring it full circle, 
when I think about a restaurant like Tatiana at a place like Lincoln Center, which is arguably the center of the universe, and there's not a person on the global stage that would not find that dining experience at that location, something that they would want to have. To me, there's hope in that. Yes, absolutely. Hope and curated by a young person who recognizes it, which I think is really quite beautiful. If you know where Lincoln Center is, and not just as a tourist. There's a cross-section of economic statuses that are in that same walking circumference between Amsterdam and or 10th Avenue and or Park. Go a few blocks in either direction. Yeah. Either direction. Yep. And there's Section 8 and there's a penthouse and there's everybody that is there. So... That's a wonderful thing about New York. You don't know what someone's economic status is, but we all are part of the energy and culture of what surrounds us. And so to have a young brother who represents a demographic that one would not automatically paint in Central Park a region or Lincoln Center area, I just think is just timely, ideal, unapologetic, as he referenced, and we need to be able to recognize ourselves in spaces in a natural way. And so I can't wait to go for a whole lot of reasons. Tasting the food is one thing, because I love good food, but also just to support the continuum of such. I'd say Tatiana is certainly on our list. <laughs> yes, we have a long list, my brother. Yeah, I know. We got a lot of eating to do. <laughs> Ambassador Shabazz, how we move. We're going to be moving into some restaurants this year where we're going to be right. eating. But lovely to see you, my sister. You too. Take care. Mm -hmm.